Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Shane Squark, and on behalf of the Market Technicians Association, I'd like to welcome you back to another webcast as part of the MTA's Educational Web Series. Today, on September 12, 2012, I'm joined by Matthew Verdow as he presents an introduction to GAN's Square of Nine. With an honors degree in computer systems engineering and seeing a place in the market for a quality technical analysis software application that removed the limits on how traders wanted to analyze the markets, Matthew started Market Analyst Software in 1996. Since that time, he has dedicated himself to learning about technical analysis with a bias towards the traditional and esoteric works of W.D. Gann and his contemporaries. One of the key mantras around Market Analyst Software has always been, we are not the experts, we program what our clients need. It is with that mantra that Matthew spent time with many of the modern, most sought-out after experts from around the globe, dedicated to develop into market analyst techniques that would assist his clients. As always, we do welcome your questions throughout the entire presentation. However, in the interest of time, we will not be able to address them until the very end. As a reminder, your participation in today's live webcast does qualify you for two MTA continuing education credits, which will automatically be added to your account if you registered online through the MTA shopping cart. And at this time, it is my pleasure to introduce you to Mr. Matthew Verdow. Wonderful. Thanks, Shane. Thanks so much for uh, that introduction and welcome everybody and thanks for uh, tuning in. All right, so GAN square of nine. Uh, we'll just get straight into uh, the material there. Now, as um, Shane has said, you know, my whole approach has always been that I am a computer systems engineer first and foremost and it is with that mindset that I've gone around the world and learnt from people who I would deem to be some of the experts in, uh, in GAN and Square of Nine and those types of techniques. And uh, I'll have a couple of their names at the end of this presentation you know, for people who want further information. But in the unique position that I have, I've been able to learn a lot of things. And a lot of that is what I'd like to share with you today as we go through this seminar. So a couple of things that we'll be talking about, um, the history, um, GAN, I, I do a little bit of coverage on uh, who GAN was and how he came about knowing about the square of nine and uh, the uses that we have for it. Then we'll be talking about how we use it in price, how we use it um, in time, uh, putting them all together and, and the golden rules uh, which I think apply to a lot of GAN techniques, not just the square of nine. And then some further information and a special offer for uh, MTA members only. So uh, about me, I think we've covered pretty much everything there. Um, I think one of the things that uh, you know, I would stress is that I love technical analysis, I love GAN, I love the combination of time and price and seeing things just come together that uh, you wouldn't otherwise see. And the, the things that just don't really make sense, um, uh, but you just see them happen time and time again. I, I just love that type of stuff. And so this is for me a, a passion uh, and I'll just keep continually developing ideas because it's what I love to do. Obviously, with any type of presentation like this, we, uh, we have to have a bit of a disclaimer here. So just for the, the sake of the legal compliance department, uh, let me just read out that obviously this information is provided for education only. Uh, there is no warranties provided with it, um, whether it's accurate or whether it's fitness for any purpose. If you're going to uh, take any of this and start trading from it, you should do so in consideration with your own independent financial and professional advice. Uh, so we'll just cover that off. All right, who was W.D. Gann? I think first and foremost, he was a mathematician. He was um, somebody who just loved the markets. Uh, he was a, a selling cigars on trains in Texas in the 1800s when he started hearing businessmen talk about the markets and that piqued his interest. And from there, he went on to join a stockbroking firm and just study charts. But more than just studying them like most people obviously at that time were doing, he then went on to look in detail at the relationship between time and price. 
and he believed that there was an interconnection between time and price, but also in, in the rest of the world. And he started seeing parallels between markets and between uh, other aspects, so be it subatomic um, uh, chemistry, physics, um, and other uh, disciplines. What he did in the 1900s is he actually obviously was, had his interest piped about um, some of the more ancient mathematical and ancient philosophies. So he took some time off and he went and spent a couple of years in Egypt and India. And it's on his return from that expedition uh, that he first started writing about his square of nine technique and his cycle charts. Um, and so we led to believe, because he never actually said it outright, but we led to believe that it was during that expedition that he found out uh, about this whole technique. And so the square of nine was one of the, uh, the main discoveries of that. So here are a couple of examples. Um, in the, the ancient world, there's lots of places where you'll see circles and squares and the intersections of those. Uh, this one here on the, the right is out of an Indian temple. Um, and it's just this theme of squares and circles and we've got the nine squares in the middle. Um, and you know, it, we can only speculate that this was one of the, the key things that he saw and he started applying to the markets. And you can even see here on the left this logo that uh, he actually used himself for his own company. Uh, had the intersection of a circle, a square and a triangle. The three basic building blocks of geometry. So I, there's a point of clarification that I need to make right from the outset. And that is that in reality what we know as the square of nine now is probably not what he actually calls the square of nine. Uh, he would have called it a spiral chart. When you read through his notes, his uh, marketing material and his coursework, you'll see reference to spiral charts and wheel charts um, and the wheel of nine and, and things like that. Um, but very rarely did he actually call it a square of nine. In fact, the square of nine was uh, actually a, a nine by nine grid. Um, and I have an example of it here. So this is actually what he would have called. Now, for the purposes of what we're going to do today, we're still going to call it the square of nine. It's what everyone is mostly common uh, knows of this whole technique as. Um, but I think if we're going to be pedantic, we would have to say that it actually isn't what he called himself. But nevertheless, it's still a very powerful technique. Um, so we'll just keep going with that. Here we see on the right the traditional square of nine. So basically we start um, usually with one in the middle and we can go around clockwise and you can see that we're increasing numbers. So we have two, three, four, five, around to nine and then we progress into the next level and then go around again. And so this type of um, calculator, the best way to imagine it is like the pyramid here on the left hand side where we have one at the top then the next series of numbers etc uh, going down. And it's like we have a bird's eye view of the, uh, the pyramid as we look at it. Now let me just change to that slide. One of the main uses of the, uh, the square of nine originally was using it as a squares and square root calculator. So what you can see I'm not sure how big this is on your screens, but you can see the numbers here, 4, 16, 36, 64, 100, and 144. They're all our even squares, 2 squared, 4 squared, 3 squared, um, sorry, yeah, um, sorry, 6 squared. I'm, I'm having a brain fade at the moment. 8 squared, 10 squared, and 12 squared. And then conversely here, we can see our odd squares. So 3 squared, 9, 5 squared, 25, 7 squared, 49, 9 squared, 81, etc. So this was a way that it was very easy to visualize and just say, well, okay, if I've got any number, I can very easily um, find the square roots and the squares of that. 
it was a, a very simple calculator for, the, for people to use. As we rotate around the square, we're alternating between um, the square roots. So we're starting at 1, we have 2 squared, 3 squared, 4 squared, 5 squared, etc. as we keep spiralling out from the centre. So it was a nice easy way for uh, people prior to calculators to work this out. Now in the use of a square of 9, and, and we'll get to lots of examples shortly, uh, the angles are probably what is most important. Because what we're looking for is relationships between numbers. And this is a, a I guess, a common thread in the work of GAN, is the whole study of cycles, but the whole study as well that the actual numbers are important and there is a relationship between numbers. Now one of the ways that we can do that is here with the uh, square of 9. Uh, we can find numbers in the grid and then we look around and, and we find um, another number 90 degrees around the square of 9, 180 degrees, etc. And there's a number of angles which we'll cover shortly which uh, Gan marked as very important ones to consider. When we are looking at a, uh, a square of 9 like this though, there was one set of angles which is most commonly known as the cardinal cross. And that is basically the north, south, east, west angles. And you see them here highlighted in yellow. These are important um, numbers. And as you go around the market and you study different charts and you apply tools like this, it is uncanny how many times you see numbers like these stopping the market. And I'm going to be the first to put my hand up and say, I can't tell you why. I, I don't know why the markets behave like that. Uh, all I guess I really care about is that if I can derive an advantage out of knowing this, that I most certainly am going to take advantage of it. So let's go and have a look uh, in the markets. One of the first things that we're going to have a look at is uh, what we call the static number series. Um, that's where we just take the numbers that are on the square and we convert them into, uh, into prices and we just look at some examples uh, of that. Okay. Obviously for these examples I'm using Market Analyst um, but the techniques can be used with a calculator and a pencil. Um, you, know, you, you don't need to use uh, software for that. But let's have a look at some here. So this one here is actually Facebook, a shining star of the IPO success if ever. Um, what we have is just looking at a, a segment of the, um, the market from August 13 until just a couple of days ago. Uh, where we've had a, a big run down. Now, I'm not picking a starting point for this tool. All I'm doing is writing lines at significant points on the market, and so uh, on the square of nine. So if I come back, let me just come back to uh, the, uh, the square of nine here. Uh, I'm just finding numbers from around here and drawing them on the chart. And that's all this tool does. 60, remember we talked about cardinal, uh, is important. It stopped the market on this number. Now an important little digression that we probably need to make at this point is that you can see that I've put here that we're running a price unit of 0.1. What that means is that I'm actually not looking for 17.6 on the square of 9, but I'm actually looking for 176 and I'm working off that number. Um, I guess as an, a, a bit of an explanation, anything to do with GAN, so if you ever study GAN, if you ever work with GAN, probably one of the most critical things that you're going to have to master is the knowledge of the price unit. Now with GAN, we've all seen the GAN fan, which looks a, a lot like this graphic here, where there is a one by one line. That one by one is often called a 45 degree line. But unless you're using graph paper, it's not always going to be a 45 degree line. What we need to think of 
is it for one unit of time, which for most of us on most of our charts is going to be from one bar to the next. So one unit of time, we have one unit of price. Now in this previous example here, for my unit of price, I said 0.1. It's a very common theme that you're going to do time and time again if you ever do any work with GAN because without having the time frames correct, um, the tools just won't work. And the thing that makes it almost half art and half science is that that number can vary between different equities depending on what trading range they're at um, and, and the tool. So it's one of those things that with experience, you get to learn how to pick the right um, price unit uh, for that security. All right, so back to here, we've got 360 degrees here. You can see the 180 degrees, and you can just see the points even here at 120 where the, uh, the market bounced off. Now this shows a lot of the angles that GAN had said were very important. So the 45 degrees, the 90, the 120, the 180, the 240, the 270, the 315, and obviously the 360. Where those angles come from is dividing the circle into um, 90 degree intervals and 120 degree intervals, uh, and the first two 45s. Uh, if we go back, well, I won't go back to it now, it's a, a number of slides ago, but if you remember that graphic of the square and the triangle inside the circle, that's where all of these angles are coming from. All right, let's keep moving on. So here is a, uh, where I'm showing on the square of nine where all these numbers come from. So you can see that we're starting our zero degrees uh, to the west. Now, there are different schools of thought on where that technically should start and even on the rotation, which way the rotation should go. That's fine. Modern software uh, lets you pick the starting point, the starting direction, and the rotation. Uh, at the end of the day, it doesn't make uh, any difference to the calculations uh, that we're doing. So what we've got here, uh, 176, we can see from the bottom here. Uh, then 45 degrees around, we've got our 183, uh, which again, because of our factor, is $18.30. And then we keep going around. Now obviously these ones here which are green aren't so obvious to pick. It's, it's not such an, an easy number um, to find. Um, but you can see that the software is able to get an exact number. Uh, 194.7 is what it would have picked. And I'll show you later how we actually do that with a mathematical formula. And then we continue around in one whole rotation. And that's what we have here. Uh, going up on this Facebook chart. And again, uh, just to reiterate, we're not picking a starting point. This isn't a tool which is calculated from the opening price on Facebook. This is a tool where all it is doing is drawing very static numbers with no consideration at all to uh, what that underlying security is. Uh, and it's, that's why I just love it because I just find it so amazing how it has an influence. All right, rotation. The key is the rotation, particularly as we expand and contract, and I'll talk more about that shortly. Um, we've just got to understand that as we go around the square, we're rotating. So from here, we're coming around to nine, and then we go to 10, we go around again, and then we just keep rotating around these squares as we expand. Future highs and lows uh, are quite often can be found by uh, rotating through a number of cycles. So this was an interesting comment from uh, the GAN, you know, in his writings in the, um, I'm just trying to read my notes. Um, the circle of 360 is the most important for time cycles and price resistance. And it's something that he kept coming back to again and again. Now, obviously, let me just again digress. Dan wasn't right 100% of the time. Um, he had obviously a ticket 
uh, and Digest interview in the early 1900s where he had a phenomenal success rate of 198 successful trades out of 226. Um, you know, a fantastic win rate. And this was in the, um, in the, it, it, with a witness watching on as he was doing that. But not all of his forecasts were accurate. Half of his success definitely came down to very strong money management rules. Uh, and he was obviously very good at that as well. Um, but nevertheless, he did talk a lot about cycles. He did talk a lot about how the, the price and time can be worked out with tools like this. Uh, and it's, a, it's an advantage that we can have. All right, let's have a look at another market. This is the US dollar against the euro, uh, daily bar chart. And again, all we're doing, now obviously the factor on this one um, is, I think it's uh, 0.001, I actually didn't write it down. Um, but you can see here again how those numbers with no consideration to a starting point are significant and how the market seems to treat them as support and resistance. So you can see all those red marks that I've put above and below uh, just showing some of these interesting points. Now, again, there are some lines there which aren't being considered, um, uh, but for the most part, uh, you can see that more are than aren't, and so it, it's a very powerful tool to have in your arsenal. I'll just let you examine that chart a little bit more before I change, because there's a, there's a lot of turning points on there, and it really does highlight the power of this tool. All right, here is another one. This now sort of more shows the expansion. So obviously we've talked about angles and how important they are. What I've done here is then taken Apple, um, put the, again, the static tool on, and remember as we're cycling around um, and looking at these angles, what we expect to see, because the squares getting bigger with every revolution, is that the distance between our angles and price is going to become greater and greater. It almost looks logarithmic. Um, and that's what you can see here. So this is, the red lines are 180 degree lines. The uh, blue lines are the 360 degree lines. And you can see how it's just expanding and expanding, getting bigger and bigger as um, the price goes higher and higher and as we are traveling around the, uh, the square of nine. Um, just as a contrast, I have what a logarithmic chart would look like. So you can see that it's not quite logarithmic. The, if this was a, a logarithmic scale, uh, if it was a logarithmic calculation, I should say, you would see these now being even now that we've made our scale logarithmic. Um, but because it's not, we know that it's not, it's probably more like a log two or a natural log, um, but that's something that I haven't verified yet. But, more of an inkling I've got from looking at the, uh, the way the, the relationship works. All right, let's have a look next. So remember before I spoke about the formula. If we had to go around counting boxes, even with a computer program, and you're talking about um, the Dow, et cetera, being up around 14,000, uh, that takes time. It takes a considerable amount of time. Fortunately, what we have is a formula that makes that really easy for us uh, and can be used on any program. So again, you know, I, obviously I am market analyst and I'm, I like everyone buying our software, but you don't need to. If this is a technique you want to use, you just grab a starting point, a major turning point in the market, and you apply this calculation to it. And you can come up with some levels uh, that will uh, uh, give you these square of nine prices. So what we can do is we can start with our starting price as, uh, as X, and then we add to it um, our angle, be it 360 or 180, et cetera, um, and we divide that by 180 and square the result, and that gives us our new price. Now, for those that are familiar with trigonometry, you'll know that uh, the 180 is equivalent to pi, uh, and so it really is a radian angle that what we're using here. So for a full rotation, we would put two in. So 360 degrees will give us two, uh, which is the equivalent of two pi. 
so X starting price, Y is the price that we're after, and alpha is our angle. So if we do a simple example here, we put nine in, and we want to do one revolution around, we can see it's three plus two squared, which is 25, and we can see how that works there. Now because we have this formula, we can now start our square on any price, um, and we can find uh, any value on the square. So it may be 30 or 40 revolutions away from the origin, but we can find that price and then find out what all the angles would be around the square as if we had a massive square and we're plotting it all out. So let's go and have a look at some examples of that. Take it to the next level. All right, so the first one we have here is the S&P 500. Now this is coming off the, uh, the low of 666 on the, in March 2009. And so what we've done basically is find six, um, I've just got to check, we've got a, a factor of 10. So what I'm looking for in this one is I'm finding 66 in the, uh, the square and then working all of the angles out from there. And again, you, we can see that there's some significant points. You know, this top here uh, is coming in, and we've broken through in the last couple of days, but it'll be interesting to see whether that holds. Um, but you can see these resistance lines um, and support lines continually being um, tested um, and holding uh, all through here. And this is obviously the, the one revolution uh, gets us to there. Obviously, I think one of the most important angles is the 360 degrees, and so it's, it's one to watch out when this market comes up to 360 degrees um, and see what happens around there. All right, let's look at another example. Uh, this one here, Microsoft, off the, uh, the recent high in March 2012. Um, I've added an extra couple of lines here. Uh, you can see the 135 and the 225 uh, that I've added in. Uh, again, it's a, it's a one day chart, but we're going from the top instead of from the bottom. So this technique works both ways, whether you're going up from uh, a low or you, you're starting at a top and you're going down. If you're going down, all we do, if we come back to our formula, is instead of the plus, we would do a minus in there. Because instead of adding two um, the number two for a full revolution, we would subtract two, and that way we are contracting rather than expanding. Uh, let's go back to that page. So we've got that chart there. Again, it's a great example, just sort of showing uh, the, the support. You can see the 240 degrees was pretty much right on the money on this one, and then the run up comes back up to the 90 degrees. Uh, and so again, a, a number of, of great little um, support and resistance points coming from that. All right, this one's a little bit different. What I've done here is, and this is going to fly in the face of all the people who are, are talking about a, a wonderful Dow comeback. Um, this is the Dow valued in gold. So in, in the software what I can do is I can just change, instead of valuing a security or a commodity, in terms of US dollars, I can actually value it in um, Australian dollars, in British pounds, in euros, or um, in this case, in gold. And so what we see is that from 1999, the Dow has been on this, um, this slide, uh, when you consider the Dow in terms of gold. Really the best way to, to paraphrase it is to say how many ounces of gold would it take to buy the Dow? Uh, and that's really the value uh, that you would have. So what we see here, and I guess the reason I chose this was to prove that even in what we could deem as a synthetic market, um, these principles still hold. And we can look at these levels. Now, again, if there's a, a breakthrough like this that we're looking at right here, I don't deem that necessarily as proving that the line doesn't hold. There's times on 
Fibonacci lines or any technique I've seen where the market pushes through. There's a rapid push through, but it comes back within a couple of days. Um, and I think that that still uh, deems that to be a, a valid line. Uh, and you can just see the points where it just keeps bouncing off these lines. And we continue down uh, through here, uh, here, and then still, you know, we're talking now from 1999 to here, so we're talking uh, uh, 12, 13 years later, this is still um, significant lines. Now what we could do is go to every major turning point and add one of these series and cluster all those lines up and where we get lots of overlap is obviously going to be very significant but for the purposes of the exercise and explaining how the square of nine works and is used uh, we didn't want to do that all right so let's take a another example this is just the dow this time in us dollars again from the top just taking that first little run down and having a look so we take the price at the um 1420 um, sorry, 14,000 um, two hundred and what we've done is we've applied a factor of 10. So what I'm looking for, and for some reason my images have just gone a little bit skew with. What I've got in here is um, the 1273, which is my um, my secondary point as we come down, and above that is the 14 um, the 1420 that we're starting with. So what we've done is we've got our starting point here at 1420. Remembering we're using a factor of 10, so I'm, I'm taking one decimal place out of it. 1410, one revolution down, uh, so we're going 360 degrees anti-clockwise around the square of nine, and we come out with 1273, which is this point here. Uh, again, you, you can see just these examples, uh, and I don't have to go searching hard to find examples. I can open up pretty much any security and be able to apply these and sometimes it's a little bit of work with what the price unit, what the correct unit to use is, but for the most part uh, you can find examples like this in any market. Um, again an example of using a live chart, we've got a, a 15 minute chart here coming in from Bloomberg um, and this was yesterday. Uh, grabbed a low uh, from here in the morning and we can see again how even on these real-time markets um, we're getting support and resistance lines uh, coming up. It's, it's always amazes me when you see the market just rocketing with momentum and then suddenly just halting um, on, on one of these lines. It's, it's a bizarre thing but uh, again I love it. All right, next one. Okay, so what we have here is a cluster. What I've done is, this is the same chart that we had before uh, with this starting point, but now I've added two extra. So I've got a blue one, I've kept them all the same color this time, so it was easier to see um, the differences in what's going on. But what we're looking for here, what stands out to me immediately is how there's a clustering of these two lines together. Uh, that becomes you know, very important and sort of starts ringing alarm bells that, hey, there's going to be major support and resistance where multiple tools or multiple calculations are coming in together. And so, again, it's a, it's a very important thing. So what we've done there with all these examples, again, if you imagine the, the square of nine like this case here, we found our starting price or our turn, or whatever our turn is, we found it on the square and then we've done our angles from there in either direction um, to get our results. But another technique with the square of nine is that we can actually put those turning points into the center of the square of nine and then we can look at angles from there. So a couple of examples uh, of that again. So this is that uh, 15 minute euro um, again. It's got a factor of 0.01 this time instead of 0.001. Uh, reason for that is that because I'm not traveling so far around the square, 
I don't need to have such a small factor. I can bring my factor up by one scale of 10. That's what I've done here. Starting at the, uh, the bottom, you can see here the, uh, the 1.2755. Um, with that factor, it's uh, 1275 is, is the number we want to start with uh, on the square. And this is the property. So if anyone there is actually using Market Analyst, this is the property that you need to tick to, uh, to achieve that. And again, we can see. We can see what's happening. We can see how this market's bumped right up against 240. So funnily enough, this is the same slide that we were using earlier. And you can see here, this is the, the Euro dollar. Um, and then as I've gone along making these slides, you can see what's happened. It's bounced off here, gone all the way up, and then stopped short um, right on the, uh, the 240 line there. Um, and you know, with any type of GAN line like this, is it a certainty that it's going to stop? No. You know, it pushed through this one, it pushed through that one. But with anything, if we see a change in trend following touching one of these lines, then yeah, that's a confirmation. Um, but of course, sensible money management rules need always apply. All right, let's have a look at the next example. Oh, sorry, this is the same one, um, just again showing the square of nine. Now what you can see here is this is what I was saying about the 1275 being centered in. And then if we go around one revolution, our 360 degrees is here at 1283. Now you may be saying, hang on, that's not 360 degrees. 360 degrees should be out here. It's one of the vagrancies of the square of nine in that as we're going, we're starting here and we're rotating around. This is considered a full rotation. Um, that error is which I think we could call between this point and that point becomes less and less significant as the numbers get bigger and you get further away from the center of the square. That when you're right up close to the square, uh, it can sometimes really throw you when you're, when you're thinking, what's going on? This doesn't look like um, being 360, yet that's the value I've got. So the 1283 here, and we can come and look here and we see 1283 for our 360 degree line um, there. And then also, if we continue on, so we go into the next revolution and we continue on to around 180 degrees, we can see here, the, uh, the 1.2905, and these are our values in here. Obviously, again, the formula becomes a lot more accurate, um, and that's the advantages that we have with our modern computers. So you can see that it's useful. You know, when the starting the price at the center of the square, where that is used most is on intraday charts. And the reason for that is that with intraday, you're off, often looking for much smaller moves. Um, and so it makes it a lot better to have our turning points in the center. Because then we're starting to get these angles and these important numbers come up a lot sooner than if we had 1275 way out at the extremities of the square and we're waiting for like a 500 point move um, before we would get any sort of change. All right. So that's dealing with the price. So what we've covered is just the static numbers and their relevance to the market. We've looked for turning points at the extremities of the square and the relationships as we move around the square of nine and also putting a price in the center of the square of nine and how that changes the whole dynamic of it as well. But the next section that I'd like to cover is the square of nine in time. Uh, because whilst we've done all our calculations with price, we can do them all with time as well. And it gives fascinating results. Now with time, there's actually two different ways that we can uh, deal with it. Um, the first one, is actually that ring. You've seen on these graphics that we have of the square of nine is there's a date ring around the outside. And that's uh, a 
a very interesting way of just doing some really simple analysis. So let's just have a look at this case example. And this is coming off the, the high of the, uh, the Dow and the S&P in October 11, uh, 2007. So what I've done, so in, in any plastic square of nine or in a program like Market Analyst, you can drag this up and down. I've centered the October 11 as our starting point. And then from there, what we do is we go around looking at the 90 degrees. Now, you can see this blue cross, the cardinal cross I've put on. I've just put on a squares overlay, square meaning 90 degrees. Um, and so I can go searching for those dates. So as we move around 90 degrees, the first date that we find is the January the 8th. Um, and so uh, that's the one here. We'll keep moving around and we've got April the 8th and July 11. Now, an interesting thing again with the square of nine is that these dates, so these four dates which are the cardinal dates based off that major high that we had in the market are going to be significant for a number of years to come. Sometimes um, their influence is uh, counteracted by other things that are going on in the market um, and I've seen it where in the first year they have very little effect but in subsequent years they can be very important um, and so it's really just looking at it and looking at the examples um, and just being mindful as these dates are coming up. So here's an example using the S&P starting at that 2007 um, high and what I've got on this one, I just need to refer back to my notes, is the 90 degree lines are red, so the cardinal lines that we were looking at. Um, and you know, so here's an example. So here's our first one, January 8. There is really not much happening there. The, you know, the market continued down and when you zoom in, you see there was a little bit of an uplift there and then just went on its way. Um, but as we keep going, you can see that here and in the next one, um, so this was January the 7th, is the equivalent angle, uh, you can see is a lot more significant, um, being the end of this little run up from here and then the continuation of the, the downward market. The other lines we have there, the green ones, 120 degrees, so basically a triangle around the square. Uh, and looking at those angles, um, you can see again that there are uh, a number of, of ones which are of mild significance. Um, and then the 30 degree. And this is the one that amazes me, is that a, a 30 degree line um, coming off that square, basically you know, within a, a day or two um, was on the, the bottom of the market. And so it's Again, to reiterate what I said before, how do you know in advance whether it's going to be significant or not? You just don't. All it's doing is it's giving you an indication that, hang on, there's a day coming up here which has a mathematical relationship to a previous major turn in the market. So let's watch out and be ready in case there is some sort of change of trend happening. Another example, ExxonMobil. Um, just running around the dates there. Uh, again, these are just 120 degrees from the high in February 2011. And again, it's just another example of seeing how these just correlate with changes in the market. Um, and sometimes it may not be a change. Sometimes it's just like a crazy day happens. Uh, and that's why, again, you know, I, I really try and, and tell everybody, just because the market does something crazy on a day where one of these dates comes in, you've got to wait for the confirmation. And if we waited just one day after, we would have had a higher bar, uh, which is our green bars here, and we would have straight away known, no, that's not a change. It's, uh, it's going to continue on. All right. So that's looking around the outside, using that ring around the outside of the square of nine. But what we can also do is what we did with price is that we can uh, center the time in the middle of the square 
and then do our calculations from that. Um, and it's, it's actually with some level of embarrassment that I, I have to say that I didn't realize that I didn't have a tool for this in Market Analyst. Um, so I had to use one of our manual calculators in the program uh, to do this. So that's why you'll see over here that I'm writing these all out as scripts. Uh, but that's probably good because it, it lets you see how I've been calculating um, all of these. Um, I think in one of our, our free updates coming up, we'll be adding a number of time-based square of nine tools just to, to make all of this a little bit easier. Um, what we did here, so we're taking IBM 1st of April in, um, sorry, uh, 3rd of April in 2012, and we're putting that date in the, uh, in the center of the, the square of nine. And then from here, you can see these calculations. I'm just saying, well, let's do a square of nine, one revolution out. And you can see one revolution out was this, the end of this run up from here. Now, remember, our square of nine starts with one in the center, goes around nine to uh, do one revolution. If we count the bars, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So we've got nine bars there, confirming that this is 360 degrees in, in bars. And then we can look here, we can see these next uh, couple of turning points. And again, you can see how amazing these are at highlighting days of changes in market. Now, obviously, you can see by my calculations here that I'm not showing everything. Um, there were some in there that didn't have um, some results, but they, um, Definitely there is a, a lot there. So you can see here we've got 90 degree, 270 degree in the, uh, the second revolution and 270 in the third revolution. And you can see how they've uh, resulted in these marks, in these um, uh, dates. Um, there's a question just coming through of do these number spirals, do they have any relation to the Fibonacci spiral? Not quite. The Fibonacci expansions, obviously at the 1.62 or thereabouts, um, mathematically I think this is different, but I haven't actually confirmed it. Um, so I, I, I'm just a little bit of hesitation there. Uh, but nevertheless, the principles are the same. So you do have this expanding and contracting, but it's, it's a different value than Fibonacci. What is of interest on this chart is to look at the time control. So you can see this tool lets me say, based on my starting date, I'm going to do this calculation. Uh, it's a timeline and I'm doing it in bars. So we, we're ignoring weekends in these calculations. What I've done on the next slide is just change, I use the exact same numbers, but just change this to be calendar days instead. Now immediately what's a standout is this April 23 low. So you can see here that our 270 degree on the second revolution, and if I go back one slide, our 90 degree on the first revolution are both hitting that day. Again, what we've got is a, a confluence of multiple calculations coming in on one day, which is extremely important. And so we, we know that this is a day that we have to watch out for. And to view that day, so here's the day, the, uh, the 4th of uh, April. Um, and you can see that as we're moving around, um, going into our second circle, so on our second revolution at 270 degrees, we have April the, uh, 23rd. And that's where this line here comes from. All right, let's have a look at the next example. Um, Google, same type of um, uh, principle. We're using 90 degrees and 270 degrees uh, from the uh, 26th of July in, in 2011. Um, and this is just repeating through the first, second, and third revolutions around the square. And again, you can just see some interesting lines. I mean, some like this. I mean, obviously, yeah, there was a change there. Here it caused almost what I would call a disturbance in the trend rather than a changing trend. 
Um, but they're just points here, it's done nothing. And there are many lines that will do nothing at all. Um, but again, we would be watching for it and then waiting to see what happens. All right, so now we're coming to uh, putting it all together. The golden rules, if you like. This is what I would say to anybody considering any type of GAN technique. Now what I've shown you obviously is, a, is one that I think a lot of, um, but I think there's some rules that have got to be, um, be said, and that is never to adopt a new technique without testing it. You've got to know, you've got to have the confidence if you're going to put it in. Don't neglect what's been working for you in the past. It's one of the things that I find most frustrating when people come into GAN and they think, great, I can throw away everything else and just exclusively use GAN. Some of the best GAN traders I know around the world will still use oscillators, they'll still use momentum, and they still have this confirming standard, well, we call it standard technical analysis, but I, I'm afraid that that sort of belittles it when that's not the intention. There are some powerful momentum-based technical analyst techniques that are working. Don't neglect them and just exclusively go to GAN uh, and wait for the, the confirmation of the change in trend. As I said before, these things don't work all the time. Build a case. When you get one tool and you put it on and there's a line, yeah, that's, that's interesting. But what you really need to do is start adding other lines. Calculate from other turning points in the market. Do you start seeing confluence? Um, because if you do, then they're the prices you need to watch. Now, programs like Market Analyst put in clustering tools which allow you to even hide away all of the um, actual tools so your, your chart's not inundated with thousands of lines, but they just give you a summation where there's overlaps um, between lines, and that makes it really easy to do that. All right, so further information. This is what I was saying. There's two people in particular who I would recommend if you want to know more about the square of nine and, and different GAN techniques. Uh, one of them is the CMT, uh, MTA's own uh, Constance Brown, uh, and her web address is there at aeroinvest.com. And the other gentleman is someone out of Australia who uh, is Alan Oliver. Uh, that's his website there, tradingwithgods.com. Um, don't be put off by his website looking a little bit amateurish um, and a little bit salesy. He's actually probably one of the, the people who I think in the world has a really, really good understanding of the square of nine. And for his students that I think buy his $700 course on it, he actually puts out weekly video blogs uh, explaining every week a different setup and, and how you use. So not only are you getting the material right up front, but the, the material just keeps coming. And if you're really interested in this, it's a fantastic resource. Just a couple of slides here on our product. Market Analyst 7, now I've been using 7.1. So if anyone's out there on 7.0, there are a couple little differences, but 7.1 is coming out soon. Hey, we're a company. We love technical analysis. We don't just do GAN. Um, there's a whole wide variety of different types of techniques from statistics and um, dynamic market profiles and all sorts of things that we'll do. Um, but of course, we have all the traditional technical analysis, back testing. We're even doing three-dimensional work trying to see what we can do with three dimensions over two and are there some advantages that we can get out of the market. Obviously a modern, easy to use interface with multi-touch, simple report publishing. If you need to repub publish reports and charts and notes, we've got stuff built in our, uh, our new 7.1 that's coming out which is going to make your life a breeze. Supported from the USA, I'm sitting here in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, our main office is still in Australia. And uh, it's giving us almost 24-hour support, but early next year we'll be opening an uh, office in Europe, um, and so we're getting 24-hour support just as we continue to expand and grow. And most importantly, we continue to be developed by a dynamic company. You know, we believe that Market Analyst is a fantastic product, but uh, we ain't finished. There's a lot of dreams that we have, a lot of ideas, a lot of ideas that our clients have been coming to us with, and we're keen to develop. And so, you know, I would 
say to anybody out there, if, you're, if you've got ideas on different technical analysis techniques, different charting techniques, talk to me. Uh, I'd love to know about it. I'd love to uh, work with you uh, on seeing those ones come to fruition. So finally, the MTA offer. Uh, any MTA member that goes to our website, uh, listed down there at mav7.com forward slash MTA, um, and if you do, if you look at it and you decide, hey, this is a, a product that I'd like to get, there's a 20% discount um, that we've got on if you uh, order it before September 30 of this year. Again, even if you're not, even if you're not really interested in buying it, what I would encourage you to do is register for a trial. Download the software, have a look at it, try these techniques. You can try these techniques for 14 days in a trial version and see how they go and try them on your own markets. See if it's something that gels. Uh, because if it does, they're great techniques to, uh, to add in to your trading toolkit. And that's it. Thank you so much for listening. There's a couple of questions that um, I'll deal with now. Um, let me just scroll back up in here. Um, is there a way to lock the chart to hold a perfect one by one grid? Yes, there is. Um, I can't really show it to you here. Let me just jump back to a chart. You see this little little lock down here? This is our what we call this our geometric lock. And this is particularly for people who are doing geometric tools. Um, what we can do is when you set up a chart, you can lock that. And then you can zoom in and out, scale back and forth, but the X and Y will not change. And so they stay completely locked. Now if I wanted that to be one by one, I would actually just type one in here and then that would stay as a one by one chart. All right, next question. Um, are there general guidelines to what price factor to use in the square of nine? I guess the general guidelines that I would use are is starting looking at the number. So the Dow Jones trading at 14,000, um, I'm looking at 10 or 100. I'm trying to bring it back because if I left it at 14,000, it's a long way around the square before we're going to come back to 360 and I could be missing a lot of turning points. And so we're trying to bring it back into something um, which is, is usable there. Um, but this is what I was saying where it becomes half art and half science. Um, it, there's just a feel that you get. The more you do this, you get to get an idea of what markets respond to what price units. A question from Stuart. Uh, where is start two on the Euro chart? Around slide 28, 29. Let me jump back there and see if I can find... Um, Start to, I'm sorry, I don't really understand the question. So if you can uh, put that in again, um, I'll see if I can answer it. Otherwise, just email me and uh, uh, we can do that. Oh, start two, I see on this one. Okay, start two is here on the bottom. So what I've done is on this chart is I took the three successive bottoms and they, they were my starts going up. And you can see here how even this one uh, must be at 45 degrees, has offered support in there. Uh, can you comment in GAN dates, August 8 and September 23? Key GAN dates. So there's a question here about key GAN dates, in particular August 8, September 23. They're more seasonal dates. Now, obviously, one of the things that GAN was talking about was on the key days, so the summer solstice, the winter solstice, the equinoxes. Um, these are really interesting dates in the market. And if you do a study and you go through looking at different charts, you'll see that quite often there is major turns. But the key word there is quite often. It's not a guarantee. It's not guaranteed that when these dates come up that the market is going to turn. Sometimes there are other prevailing influences which are having a much bigger effect on the market and these things can't um, affect it like maybe they would in other circumstances. 
have you constructed date rings only using trading days? No, we haven't. And it's interesting because as I was preparing this presentation, I've actually made a note to, um, to do that work uh, because that came up in my mind as well. Uh, question six, do you use the GAN square formula for calculating the support and resistance by changing the plus sign to a minus? Yes, that's correct. So where we had the formula, uh, just jumping back to here, the plus is when we're expanding or increasing going out from the center of the square, the minus is going to bring us back in. So if I start at the top, my calculation is using minuses because I want to come back down. Whether that becomes um, uh, support and resistance more, obviously a line that is support one day when the market is above it uh, can become resistance in the future when the market is traveling back up towards it. Uh, can you comment on the GAN fan tool? Um, I can. It's a little bit out of scope of what we're trying to talk about. I mean, obviously, the, the GAN fan tool is a is this whole concept of one by one. Um, again, you start using GAN fans in conjunction with um, squaring, and you'll find some very interesting intersection points. Can we get live data from outside USA or Australia? You can get live data in Market Analyst from Interactive Brokers, eSignal, IQ Feed. If you're an institutional trader on the institutional version of Market Analyst, you can get Bloomberg. So there's a whole variety of um, uh, live data sources that can be used and so these techniques can be used on. And that's all available in the trial as well. Uh, does it support Forex futures as well? It does everything. So we've had a couple examples there of um, futures, uh, sorry, um, Forex um, with the Aussie dollar, uh, sorry, the US dollar versus the Euro. Also, we had an example there of the S&P 500. Now, I could equally have done that analysis on the underlying index future rather than the cash market. It all works the same. Um, and you'll find these examples. Gan, in all of his work, uh, was mainly focused on commodities, so corn, soybeans, wheat, and there's countless examples of his books um, in doing that. Do you ever trade where it is not a confluence of levels for a price level or date in the market? Yes, um, you, you can. Uh, let me just find an example. Um, if I had one line on and I saw the market bounce and pull away, remembering what I said that you are looking for a confirmation in the change of trend. Once I get that confirmation, then it's saying, hey, the market is respecting this line. This is a tradable uh, change in trend in market. Obviously, the more um, lines I can put there, the greater the confluence of that, the more confidence I have in that being significant. Uh, but really, that also comes down to what sort of size you're trading. If I was putting um, 100 contracts of the S&P on, I would want a lot of confluence knowing what I'm doing there. Um, but if I'm just trading a single contract, uh, then I may be happy to trade off a single line like that. It really comes down to partly your risk and money management rules as well. And okay, so look, again, I just want to thank you all so much for tuning in and, and listening to this, uh, this webcast. It's, it's been a pleasure to present it. Uh, it's a very wild area of technical analysis and, and if you've never seen this type of stuff before, it can be quite daunting. Uh, but it's a, it's a wonderful uh, area to study and I think like most people that get stuck into GAN, once you start, there are just all these extra levels to, to un, uncover and, and dig around and it's just an area that I love and uh, I hope that this has been of benefit to you and thank you again so much. And on behalf of the Market Technicians Association, I'd like to thank you, Matthew, for spending some time with us today and for giving such a spectacular presentation. For those interested, this webcast will be made available on the on-demand video archives and in the MTA knowledge base before the end of the week. I do encourage you all to visit the Mark M. Analyst website and take advantage of the limited time offer that Matthew graciously extended to us. 
Mark Annalis has been a longtime supporter of the MGA and sponsor of the symposium over the years, and they truly do have a remarkable product. If you have any additional questions we couldn't get to today, please feel free to email me or another member of the MGA staff. We'll gladly pass your questions along. Thank you all for attending today, and I hope to see everyone next week as Kingsley Jones joins us from Australia to present Mind of the Market Average, the Fundamentals of Investor Sentiment. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day.